How do you translate a video game into a board game? I'm not talking about Dark Souls RPG five hour game with stats and everything. I'm talking about like 2D retro platformer side scrolling action on your table. That's what Panda Cult Games tried to do when they made the official Shovel Knight board game. Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels is a 1 to 4 player game in which players compete for collecting coins, defeating enemies, jump and spike pits, all while moving left to right on a dynamic, ever changing board that slides to reveal new challenges, all culminating in a boss fight at the very end. The person with the most money at the end wins. If you ever played Shovel Knight co-op, or maybe Super Mario 3D World co-op, New Super Mario Bros. co-op, technically you can't hurt your opponents, but you can throw them off cliffs, killing them instantly. This is just one of many conscious decisions to video gamify this board game. You can work together all you want, but at the end of the day, someone's gonna have the highest score and take the crown. It's really as simple as that. Don't let the box fool you. I got the 3D edition, which needs all this room for these beautiful little minifigures for every enemy you encounter, including the Order of No Quarter, which are also playable characters. This game replaces jumping and attacking with by chance dice rolls, which you can assist yourself with using the variety of included loot cards. You might be thinking, wait a minute, jumping over an instant death spike pit left to chance? I don't know about that. Well, at some point while you're playing this game, you do have to realize that death is certain. Every player in this game is going to die probably a few times before the end. All it means is you drop half your coins in a little pile, Dark Souls style, which means every other player is going to turn their heads to you and think, I'm going to get those coins before that guy respawns. Ah, it's mine, it's mine. It's all greed. This is all the chaotic nature of this game as you fight for the most coins while the board continues to change and adapt to new enemies, new environmental challenges, spikes, coins, shops, whatever happens, we're gonna find out. The variety in these tiles is to me what makes the game fun and unique. At the beginning of a game, you choose which boss you're gonna face at the end, and you start in the Plains of Passage, and then you move on to whatever domain this boss will be in. So King Knight would be Pride More Keep with its golden walls that lock you in, or you'll have Spectre Knight's Lich Yard, which has these lanterns you need to hop over to get through spikes and it's just like a field of spikes that everybody's gonna be fighting to get through first. And then on top of that you factor in the part where you can replay the game as different characters with different stats and different abilities. I made this little house rule where the first person to defeat one boss will get first dibs on that character and we kind of unlock them, you know, video game style as you move on, as you move through the game. Unfortunately not everything adapts from video game to board game entirely well. Uh, boss fights, for instance, all work off of these AI card decks. Every boss has their own little deck of AI attacks. By AI, I mean it just describes to you which spaces get hit by his attack and where he ends up at the end. This is a lot harder to predict, as you might imagine, than it would be in a normal video game where King Knight would do like, woo, to tell you he's about to swoop horizontally or something. He only has like three moves and you know, he, he's the first boss, he's easy. But this, he's got all these different attacks and you don't know where he's gonna go. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. You kinda can't, unless you've seen the deck a few times. They also tried incorporating Shovel Knight's iconic little pogo stick ability that he does. But it gives you diminishing returns because as you bounce on enemies, it's less likely to hit with each bounce. And you risk taking a health point for failing. And it costs money to do. Which of course, you need to keep. To win. In each game I played, nobody used this special ability once. They didn't see a reason to, and neither did I. If you've played a retro game like Shovel Knight before, you know that taking damage isn't so bad, not as bad as falling off a cliff from the knockback that you get from getting hit. You know, like in Castlevania, you get hit by one skeleton, it doesn't do much to you, but it might knock you off the cliff and kill you immediately. Well, they put that in this game. <laughs> And as funny as that is, it's just as frustrating as those old games, if not more because there's so many spikes in this game. You're going to be surrounding by spikes a lot. Of course you can just not play with the knockback rule, it really doesn't change that much, it just makes things easier for everybody, so you know, there's a little freedom there. 
Lastly, I just need to shout out the presentation of this game because it looks directly ripped from the game. Even the new assets they used for this looks like it fits in perfectly fine. The pixel art on this box, beautiful. The minifigures, as I mentioned, are gorgeous. And there's a lot of attention to detail. If you're wondering if they adapted Tinker Knight's boss fight completely like the original, they did. He has two faces. He has a giant mech. He sits in the mech. Come on. So if you're as big a fan of Shovel Knight as I am, you are going to have a really fun time seeing all the different items, all the bosses, all the dungeons, and everything translated from video game to board game, because most of it is done really well. But it's also a fun game in its own right. It's pretty quick. With a four player full game, it, it'll take about 45 minutes. Not so bad. So I, I, I'd recommend it. But you can't really get it right now. This is a Kickstarter game uh, that lasted two years and was delayed for reasons. I actually forgot about it until it just arrived on my doorstep one day and I was like, oh, wow, they finished this. Okay, cool. <laughs> so they're working on like getting all the backers their thing and then it's gonna come to retail like in the coming weeks, I guess. But judging from the Kickstarter, this game will cost you the 3D edition that I got was about $70. The standee little cardboard guy version, the 2D version, that cost about $40. But there is a catch. According to the rulebook, the actual base game, the non-Kickstarter version that they will sell, is only going to come with the Enchantress, King Knight, Plague Knight, and Spectre Knight. That's more than half the bosses and dungeons which I said was the main draw of the game, not included. They will be sold separately as expansions. I already didn't get every character, there's more. There was Mona, Black Knight, and the Wandering Travelers, those little guys who kind of wander around the map in that game. You can buy all of those, but buying them all together in addition to the 3D Deluxe version I got would have costed me an additional $70. So I was like, no. I can only imagine what everything's gonna cost altogether when it finally comes to retail in the official version. It's probably gonna be a lot. It's hard to recommend something when I don't know exactly what you're gonna get and for what price. All I can say is, if this game sounded really neat and fun to you, you will like it. You can pay $40 and get the small version, it's no problem. Expansions, if you like it, you could buy more, you know? Uh, yeah, there you go. 40 bucks really isn't that bad, it's just when you consider that somebody else got more than double the content for the same price, it kind of gets to you. I understand. I still really had a lot of fun with this game, so I'm going to give it the official Be Quiet and Take a Seat seal of approval. Thanks for watching.